Hello. Thank you. Good afternoon. We're here today to talk about this concept of Industry 4.0. And everybody's heard Industry 4.0 before, uh, but what we really want to do uh, is we want to first be able to define it uh, and understand uh, what it is, then we want to understand what it does. So, so what does Industry 4.0 do for us? Uh, but then most importantly, uh, we want to understand how we can apply it, how we can use it uh, to enhance our processes uh, and take advantage of it within our own facilities and our own manufacturing processes. So by definition, Industry 4.0 focuses on the end-to-end -end digitization of all physical assets. Uh, so. Again, Industry 4.0, this is a, a term that's broad across an entire business from all areas. What we want to do is we want to understand how it relates directly to manufacturing, helps, how it helps us produce better products at lower costs than before. In Industry 4.0, it gets its name from the idea that it is the fourth major industrial revolution. And when we look back historically at all the industrial revolutions, one thing is very, very important to note. If we take a look on the very far right side, it also shows the degree of complexity of each of these industrial revolutions. So first, starting with the first industrial revolution and the invention of steam power. Uh, and you, being able to use steam power to help power our manufacturing plants uh, and allow us to, to do more uh, it, with more energy. The second industrial revolution was the invention or the idea of the modern assembly line. So now somebody came up with the idea that rather than having one person build a product from start to finish, if we could divide that labor and create specialized tasks, we could build better products because each operator could get, could be better at building the one thing rather than the entire product. Then there was the third industrial revolution, uh, which was the integration of PLCs, really the first computer that was introduced to manufacturing. So PLCs allowed us to do repetitive tasks uh, and increase our our capacity to manufacture more efficient products. And now with the fourth industrial revolution, 4.0 is very different than the previous industrial revolutions before it. On top of it being the most complex of any of the previous ones, it also has no direct path for us to succeed. When we look at the invention of steam power, if I want to build more products, I need more energy. And this is the most efficient way I can produce energy. If I want to have a moderate assembly line, of course I'm going to build faster, better products if I divide my labor up and create specialized tasks. If I integrate PLCs, I'll become more consistent. My processes will be more uh, repetitive. But Industry 4.0, it's not as clear. There's no direct path to say, if we do this, we'll succeed with Industry 4.0. Because Industry 4.0 isn't an idea or it's not a product invention. It's simply a mechanism and a tool for us to use the information that we have available to us and to create better processes, to create better products, and to get a real true understanding of our own manufacturing processes. And with 4.0, there's two major concepts that apply specifically to manufacturing. The first of which is big data. Big data 
is, is really one of the most misunderstood concepts of Industry 4.0, which is ironic because it's also probably one of the most important concepts because big data is going to give us the information to help us create better internal processes, to get a real understanding of all aspects of our production. So again, following the same thing, first we want to understand what it is. Big data is data sets so large and complex that it becomes difficult to process using on-hand data management tools or traditional data processing applications. With more and more smart devices being integrated into manufacturing, that means more protocols, more communication types, different communication methods, and we don't have the tools in place to be able to accept all this data and to be able to interpret it. And really, big data is all of this information that needs to be configured, it needs to be analyzed. And we need a mechanism and a platform to analyze it. But when we get down to the very, very fundamental level of big data, the very thing that it solves is time to decision. Time to decision is the time it takes us to identify a problem and use analytical data to solve that problem. And big data is the best way, the easiest way to improve that time to decision. But it needs to be done and it needs to be organized in a way that we can easily access the information we need and it includes all aspects of that information. In big data, just like Industry 4.0, it applies to all areas of business, from marketing to sales, products, uh, to the actual manufacturing process itself, uh, and even the service. And here are two real champions of using big data. They use them in completely different ways, uh, but both are considered industry leaders. First, Amazon. Everybody knows Amazon. And if you've ever been searching for something on Amazon, let's say you're searching for a TV. You want to buy a new TV for your living room. You do your research, uh, and ultimately you, you don't buy the product. But a week later, you're now using a different website, doing something completely different, maybe new, looking at a news article. And you scroll down to the bottom of the, of the page, and there's Amazon. There's an advertisement for a brand new TV. How did it get there? Amazon is using big data. They're using it to create custom, unique marketing plans directly pointed at you. They knew that you looked at that TV. They knew what you were looking to buy. And they're using the data to be more efficient with their marketing efforts towards you. But Amazon also uses big data on a macro scale. So instead of just creating this unique marketing plan for you, they now take all the other people that were looking at TVs and they look and see what they ultimately purchased. So now Amazon can start advertising complementary goods to you that related shoppers purchased in the end. So we can analyze trends on a very, very micro level, but it can also be used to apply it at the macro level. And with Amazon, they're using big data, and they're using it and hoping to see that immediate payback. They want to see it within a month, within a week. And they're using it for marketing and sales. Then there's Tesla. Tesla is also one of the the best big data users and understands big data uh, within the manufacturing industry. Everybody thinks Tesla is successful because uh, they manufacture new cars that are cutting edge in technology, uh, in the design. And yes, that's true, but what Tesla understood when it first started producing cars was that, okay, we're producing these cars and we're putting them on the roads, why don't we collect the data? Why don't we understand the roads that they travel so we can start mapping this data 
about where these vehicles are going, what the pinpoints on the roads are, and with Tesla, this payback of big data is now eight, 10 years in the running. And they're just starting to realize the benefits. Because autonomous driving, there's other competitors out there that have similar technologies, but Tesla has this big data and this information of all the mapping to be more accurate and be better at it. So two different ways of using big data and two different payback structures as well. And that's one thing that's very, very important with collecting this big data. We might not know today exactly why we're collecting it. We might not know how we can use it today. But maybe we're building products and we're manufacturing something that 10 years down the road is starting to have failures in the field. We can look back at this data because we collected it. What component went into the product? What tool did we use? Was it an operator? We can use this to get a real understanding and look back to make better decisions uh, and help us ultimately produce better products. And so within manufacturing, we want to collect this big data, but we need a way to do it. We need a mechanism that allows us to do this efficiently. And with the introduction of more and more of these smart devices into our manufacturing environment, these devices are now producing signals, they're giving us more information about what they're doing. So the Internet of Things, our smart devices, is our mechanism for ultimately getting the big data and being able to improve our time to decision. By definition, the Internet of Things is a network of physical objects that can transmit or receive information. And at a more rapid pace than ever before are these devices being introduced to our manufacturing environment. Whether it be test stations, uh, robotics, automation cells, all of these different devices are producing information that has very, very significant value to us. And with these Internet of Things and with these smart devices, it's very critical that we understand how important that data is and how important it is to collect this data and then be able to make decisions with it. So big data and the Internet of Things are really linked together. The Internet of Things produces the signal, they produce the data, and big data, or excuse me, Internet of Things are the physical objects, the smart devices producing the information, and big data is the output. Big data is the information that we're ultimately going to use to improve our processes. So again, specifically for manufacturing, specifically for production, the two most important components of Industry 4.0 are big data and the Internet of Things. And one goes along with the other. Industry 4.0, not only is it less clear how we achieve it, because if we remember back, it's the most complex industrial revolution, it also challenges us internally. It challenges us to change the way we think. From the very, very highest levels of our business, we need to emphasize that Industry 4.0 and using big data and making analytical decisions is very, very important. Harvard Business Review, uh, considered an expert on big data, says what really matters more than the type and the quantity of the data is establishing a deep corporate culture of evidence-based decision making. This needs to be driven down from the highest levels uh, and it needs to be applied to making those decisions to help us improve our processes. So we understand what it is. We understand how it relates to manufacturing. Now how do we get there? How do we realize these benefits? And with 
big data and with all these devices on our production floor, we need to have a way to manage them. We need a platform that can manage these devices, that can interpret all this data, and then ultimately can give that information to all the decision makers so that they can make an informed decision. In traditional systems like the ERP system, MRP, MES systems, those lack a true understanding of production. Those lack the really, really fine details of how we grab the correct data from this device and then how we put it up uh, in our database so that we can reference it in coordination with the other devices we're pulling data from. We need a way to manage all the smart devices on the floor with a production driven platform mechanism and then have that platform or mechanism be the gateway to our ERP system. And again, this is why Industry 4.0 is so very complex. There's no clear path. There's no cookie cutter solution for every single uh, organization and every process. Paul Murad of Google uh, says one of the very, very most important aspects of big data of Industry 4.0. He says that people think about just trying to collect as much information from all kinds of different places. The key difference is making sure the data is useful and accessible by the people in your organization. This right here is the very, very critical part of big data that is misunderstood. I'm sure everybody here collects big data. I'm sure everybody collects data from all their devices on the floor. But how easily can we access it? How easily can we compare our tooling data and our tooling results to our oil film sta station, to our robot? How can we make a decision that uh, impacts our entire production floor without seeing all aspects of this information in one location? in the one platform so I can filter, manage, and manipulate this data to understand how it impacts the other portions uh, of my production, of my production floor. And luckily for us, there's an organization called PWC. PWC conducts the largest survey of manufacturing industry 4.0 efforts. They've uh, sent the survey to over 2,000 people, covering over nine manufacturing industries. And they give us the blueprint to achieving digital success. How do we get from A to Z? How do we understand this data? Then how do we capture it? How do we capture it? How do we understand it? And it gives us step-by-step -step instructions on how to get there. Because making an industry 4.0 decision is very, very different than traditional equipment decisions. Making a software decision is different than us purchasing a tool. It's different than us purchasing a robot. I can compare apples to apples what this tool does compared to this one. How long this tool will stay in production and how often it needs maintenance. With software, there's no apples to apples comparison. We need to understand what factors are important when we're making this software decision? How flexible is it? Who can access it? What's it going to do in five years? Because we want to avoid this repetitive overhaul of the systems that we use. We want to avoid that trend of every 10, every 15 years completely starting from scratch. We want a solution that will grow with our company, with our production. Uh, and that's what's very, very different about making a software decision versus making a physical equipment decision. So why are we qualified to talk about this? Why is DeSuter here today telling you about Industry 4.0? Well, DeSuter has been uh, in manufacturing for over 100 years. Here's Dave Gardner from DeSuter to tell you a little bit more about our organization. There were five DeSuters, all brothers and all passionate aviators. One of them, Marcel, was injured in an air crash. 
he lost his leg above the knee and was fitted with a wooden leg. But this wooden leg was very uncomfortable. His younger brother, Charles, thus designed for him a new leg made of duralumin. This was the first light metal limb to be manufactured. It was much more than a metal limb, but an innovation that made DeSouter a forerunner in the industry. The leg enabled Marcel to fly again the following year after his accident. Artificial limb factories were established in 1914 and Marcel became the first managing director. Wearers of DeSouter's limbs were able to walk, run, dance, and even ride a horse. Orders came in from all over the world. DeSouter developed its own pneumatic power tools for fast and efficient production of the holes needed in the aluminum leg components. Meanwhile, the company began to reorganize their work, laying the foundations for the success of the brand today. In the 1950s, DeSouter started to concentrate exclusively on the production and design of small, yet powerful, portable precision tools. Shortly after, with an increase in demand, the company began to export overseas. DeSouter, 100 years of innovation. So DeSouter has always prided itself uh, on being a very innovative company for creating innovative solutions for manufacturing. And most recently is Pivotware Process Control. Pivotware, if we remember back from the other slide, we need some sort of mechanism, some sort of gateway to be our interface between our devices on the production floor and our higher level systems a device that can push data to those higher systems. It can pull data and interpret it from those systems and manage the fine details of production. By definition, Pivotware is a comprehensive modular system providing a single station to plant-wide floor-to-ceiling process control solution. So what we mean by single station to plant-wide is Pivotware is developed and is built on a platform that allows you to implement it at a single station at a time or an entire production line and coordinate from station to station. And then when we, when we talk about floor to ceiling, when we talk about floor, we're talking about the physical devices on our production floor. And going up to the ceiling, talking about our metaphorical ceiling, uh, our enterprise systems like our ERP system, our MES, our MRP system. And Pivotware is designed to manage all these protocols from all these different devices and then be able to manage that data at the same time. And there's three really fundamental principles to Pivotware that make it unique and that make it so competitive for this process control solution. And first, it's island-based. So with Pivotware, each station has all the processes for all the models, all the potential operators, all the potential components. It has all that information stored within the station. So it's completely resilient to any network failures. Pivot where we'll operate whether or whether or not we have our communication to our higher level systems. So for us, it means we can have higher uptimes. We can continue to produce in non-perfect conditions. And then because it's island-based, that means we can also scale it. So we can implement pivot where one station at a time, or we can outfit an entire assembly line. The idea is we have that option. 
And then the third is customer ownership. Pivot War understands the need for us to be more flexible and more agile with our production processes. So we can add new models in, take models out, and even modify the processes to balance our lines. So PivotWare gives you the tools as the customer to create, manage, and manipulate your processes at your own pace. Here's an example of using Fusion and creating a step within my process using PivotWare. I open my software suite, which is part of the entire DeSudra software suite. Here I'm opening the Fusion platform. And Fusion is designed to be the one location that manages my devices and collects all my data and allows me to view it in one location. So what I'm ultimately going to do is create a tooling step so I can create process control for a tightening step within my build. In that middle section, there are all the steps I currently have within my process. And Pivotware uses a thing called variance. When we link a step that we create to a specific variant, it's like linking that step to a model that comes down the line. So every time that variant model is scanned, or every time my ERP system tells me I'm building this variant, Pivotware looks in our database that we've created of all our processes and it simply picks the ones that have that variant linked to it and puts them in the order that we created. Any of the steps that don't apply get pushed out. Pivotware offers interactive operator guidance with the tightenings as well. So I can interpret, or excuse me, I can input what I want my operator to read when this tightening step comes up. In this case, I'm saying use the DeSuter battery tool to tighten these eight fasteners to assemble my engine block cover to the main engine block. Choosing an image for this tightening step is as simple as grabbing a JPEG or a PNG file from your, your desktop, from maybe your PDF work instructions that are already in place. The entire Pivotware software suite, or Fusion I should say, is designed using drag and drop programming. So there's no complicated PLC programming interface. Any engineer can master this software and it's easier than programming a DC tool. Here I can add my hotspots to give operator guidance to let them know which fastener to assemble first and the order in which to assemble it. At the same time as guiding this process, I'm also interacting directly with my tool because my tool is a smart device on the assembly floor. So I'm enabling and disabling that tool at the exact time that I want. I'm choosing the correct torque settings and I'm managing it all through Pivotware. Because if we have one system that becomes the brains of my assembly and becomes the master of all my smart devices, then we can easily manage them together. And I've just created my tightening step. Now I'm going to input my torque values along with it. And I'll also automatically populate whatever tools, whatever devices I have available at that station. If I create a step where I don't have assets available to, to use that step, I won't be able to apply it to my station. So pivot where the idea is that Fusion gives you complete ownership whether it's grabbing information from your ERP system, whether it's pushing information out or pulling information in, making logical decisions, managing a digital pictolite system, a smart arm application, socket trays that work interdependent of any tooling brand. Because we're managing all these devices through Pivotware, we can share them and these, ex these accessories can be used at other stations. Then I simply, on the left hand side, have all my global steps that I've created and I drag it into my station. And I put it in the exact spot that I want and pivot where it does the rest.
The other component of Pivotware that works alongside with Fusion is Infinity. Infinity is the display that the operator sees. It's interactive with the operator. It allows us to log on, log off, connect our tooling, be interactive and allow the operator to accept a, a command, confirm that they did the right action. And at the same time, we're logging every single one of these steps that's completed. The exact time it started, the exact time it finished, and the entire duration at which that process took. So we get the true understanding of our process. We can understand why shift two is slower than shift one. Why Monday is slower than Tuesday. And as I mentioned, all devices on the assembly floor, any piece of equipment that can produce a signal, Pivotware can interact with. And if it cannot, we can have manual confirmations on the screen confirming that we completed these manual operations. If you want to see what that process looks like actually on the Infinity Station, come visit our booth. DeSouter is directly in the middle of the assembly show. Can't miss us. Here's an example of what the reporting looks like within my Fusion software. I can expand it to include all details or I can keep it minimal. The option is up to you as the customer. Again, a close up of what the data looks like. I know which tool was used, what the serial number was, who was logged into the system, what the results were, and time stamped from beginning to end of each process. This is big data. This data is usable to make accurate decisions and fact-based decisions using analytics. So again, the three fundamentals of the Pivotware system. One, it's island-based, so I can implement it a single station at a time. Two, it's scalable, and I can manage it at my own pace as the customer. And three, it offers unmatched customer ownership. You are now in control. You have the power of your own process in your own industry 4.0 destiny. To come back to this industrial 4.0, the degree of complexity is very, very important to understand. And Pivotware aims to help you with that solution. When we look back at all the industrial revolutions, there's always been a piece of equipment, there's always been a new idea that's propelled it and allowed the industry to reach new levels of efficiency. With the introduction of the modern assembly line, we think of Henry Ford. When we think of the PLC Industrial Revolution, we think of Alan Bradley. And with Industry 4.0, we want that to be Pivotware Process Control. Thank you very much.